Hey, what's up? It's Ed Gallo. This is the Wrestling for MMA podcast. Pretty obvious what it's about, so I'm not going to explain it this time. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of a down week. Uh, it's the Holloway Cater card. Fight site has a ton of content about that fight and that card, so I'm really not going to talk about it at all. Um, I really don't think there's anyone that interesting to talk about on it with regard to wrestling, so uh, I'm not going to. Uh, instead i'm going to take a few listener questions and i posed the you know i sent the tweet out asking for listener questions uh about 10 minutes ago and there are a bunch already and i like to strike when the iron's hot and the questions are still coming in right now so um if you want to consider it a bit of a live show just because i'm going to be doing this on the spot so if the answers aren't good i can always say hey i didn't have time to think about it it's a nice little built-in excuse there for myself. Um, that's that's a wrestling tactic for you. You always you always need to have excuses. Uh, very important. Um, okay, it's really hard to sort through these, but I'm gonna give it a shot. Anyway, I really shouldn't have done it this way, but I'm already I'm already recording. I feel I feel the energy, um, so I'm gonna do it. Uh, my first question and on the list <laughs> is uh, Brandon Gambucci, my good friend. Um, Brandon is a very high level grappler and he uh, wrestled division one at Duke University uh, injuries kind of plagued his career but uh, he was he was very high level and he beat some really tough guys and he had tough matches with some really high level guys so uh, about as good as they come just uh, someone you don't hear about just because of uh, stuff that happened you know in practice or, or, or whatnot so it's a shame but Brandon's an awesome guy one of the coolest people I know uh and yeah he he does uh like pro grappling events now like uh i don't even know what they're called you know the type anyway love you brandon uh brandon says what are the most useful skill sets that transfer from a high level folk style guy least useful that don't transfer um i talked about this a little bit on the folk style versus freestyle podcast um so most useful skill sets that translate from folk style um has to be you know writing that's what everyone says right if you take someone down, great. It's MMA. You got to keep them down. You got to do something to them. Learning jujitsu is probably the best approach, but uh, I would say jujitsu has a lot of similarities to folk style when it comes to your top game. Uh, you know, the, the wrist ride concepts, you know, if you ride with legs in, you're already pretty much halfway there. <laughs> when you go to MMA, you already know how to get back control in a, in a traditional jujitsu style way. Uh, what was always weird to me, is that Daniel Cormier became the guy who puts hooks in uh, on the back. I never saw that coming from him, mostly, you know, because AKA is like, oh, they're the the uh, folk style ride guys. Uh, he does folk style rides too in MMA, but uh, I just figured with his body type and that, I would never see him put hooks in, but he does, he did it a bunch of times. Um, all of his rear naked choke victories, uh, he put hooks in. But uh, yeah, so I just think the riding skills transfer very, very well. Um, when it comes to like not getting put on your back, um, I think folk style has a lot more leeway with that, and it, it does um, help with some of those bad habits you might have. Um, so like modern folk style, you know, people competing today is a lot different than the MMA fans' conceptualization of what wrestling is. MMA fans are kind of dated on what they think wrestling looks like. Um, wrestling is very fluid these days, especially in college. And uh, in college, they implemented the neutral danger rule, basically, which means if we're in a scramble, they're not going to call to until you've established criteria for a takedown until you have clear control and uh people really play with that rule so they'll you know roll across their back but they'll keep a leg hook they'll, keep, they'll have an underhook on the leg and they'll be on their back and their leg will be over your shoulder and they'll be in some crazy position where if you had already scored the takedown yeah that's near fall points so or that's you know close to a pin or whatever um now you get some time you know on your back to work through those positions which is more similar to jujitsu and more similar to mma um but yeah the new rule is that uh you get a five count so once you put yourself in your back um they count to five and once they hit five it's a takedown and then they're gonna start counting your fall so you got to get out of there so guys like jesse delgado or dean heil uh from the ncaa who like really lived in those positions uh it hurt it would hurt them <laughs> and uh dean heil is the only one who really suffered the consequences but the matches he lost really wasn't even about the neutral danger rule which is pretty funny um so yeah, the riding is definitely highly applicable. I also think the college season is a huge strength for these guys. I mean, 40-ish matches for starters uh, in a season, you know, that's uh, November to March. 
Uh, it's pretty insane. Uh, practicing almost every day, every week, competing at least once every week, cutting weight at least once every week, competing over the holidays. Um, it's grueling. It's just, it's so grueling competing as the same guys multiple times. Uh, it sucks. Um, it's completely unreasonable. This year, they're doing an abbreviated season because of COVID. It just started uh, this semester. Um, I think that should be the way it is from now on. Um, the, the season is too long. It's it's too de- too demanding on their bodies. You can't do that. Um, but I think just the uh, the mental edge, the competitive edge you get from coming through that system is huge. Um, also, you know, being in a college <laughs> program, getting being on a strength and conditioning program, being basically a professional athlete while balancing college kind of prepares you for the rigor of learning multiple martial arts at the same time and going through everything you need to go through to be an MMA fighter. Um, I've heard fighters say before that college wrestling is harder than being an MMA fighter, and I, I buy that. Um, so folk style implies college, and college is really one of the biggest strengths, I think. Uh, least useful skills that don't transfer? Uh, I don't know. Most of it transfers, <laughs> honestly. Um, I think maybe habits that, that can get you in trouble. I talked about this on the folk style versus freestyle podcast. You know, the fact that you can move through a lot of different positions before you get your takedown and you can you know, expose your back and whatever. Um, that's cool. But also in MMA, it kind of behooves you to finish quickly and more clean and in less vulnerable positions. So I feel that guys who maybe use or get used to uh, taking their time getting through a takedown or like just getting a really loose uh, entry on the leg and, and working their way through that or, or you know things things of that nature that can really hurt you um, also just the writing meta and folk style sometimes incentivizes guys to not have takedown games and just you know be stingy defensively on their feet and then ride out for the win and they'll get like a 2-1 riding time victory I think we all know people who do that um, that, that can't translate very well. You'll have a good ground game, but if you don't you know, have a consistent path to getting people down from neutral, that's going to hurt you for sure. Um, so that's what I have to say about that, Brandon. Thank you. I have like nine new questions since I wrote this. I'll, I'll check in on them again. I'm not going to do all of them. Uh, Andrew, who's my boy, I like Andrew. Uh, Andrew, 19, Andrew A, 1994, that's his handle. Um, he's asking about Nick Lentz's wrestling versus uh, Mosar Ivloyev's wrestling and counter-wrestling. I think that's on the uh, the McGregor Poirier card, and I'm gonna still need stuff to talk about next week. So maybe I'll save that for next week, Andrew. Um, also, I, I'd have to study to answer that, and I don't want to. <laughs> I'll talk about Ivloyev in a sec, actually, when uh, because uh, Smash Jitsu only asked a question about counter wrestling. I'll get to that. Uh, Bilal Yusuf, who's uh, at is Dead Potato One, who I really like, is very smart. Um, he asked, uh, "Why don't Americans use the Dagestani handcuffs?" He asked that to piss me off. Uh, I don't mind the the vernacular Dagestani handcuff. I think it's cool that people are interested in in riding um, and control positions and grappling. But it does imply that Khabib and his team invented it when it's a just a wrist ride. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wrist series. Um, but, you know, passing wrists to opposite side and trapping them under the belly, across the back, stuff like that. That's all. That's all folk. That's all folk style. Um, that's that's not, nothing new. Um, and even in MMA, I mean, like Brock Lesnar was using it in 2009. So really, it's not new. But cool that people like it. But he, he knows that it bugs me. So that's why, that's why he asked. Um, he was kidding. His actual question is, why is the transitional meta so different between Eastern European and U.S. fighters? The former seems to manipulate posture with upward strikes, while the latter, a more general level feint, does the U.S. folk style play a role? Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I think it's a freestyle versus, or I mean, folk style versus international styles thing. Um, the meta, the meta game is different. So I would just like to direct you to my freestyle versus folk style podcast. Um, and I talk about all of that. So thanks Bilal for letting me plug that. Um, <laughs> Willie McGonnell, W M McGonnell, no, no, W McGonnell <laughs> is his at, uh, he asks, how is a 500 district champ the best wrestler at Pitt MMA? Uh, Willie uh, trained with me in college, and he's my friend from college. Um, we had an MMA club, you know, just, just people doing, goofing around. Uh, it was kind of structured sometimes. But yeah, Willie uh, wrestled in Pennsylvania, and he was a, a district champion in like a not-so-great district in Pennsylvania, but he was like 
probably the most credentialed wrestler in the club. So he's, he's yanking my chain. Um, the club did get a lot better, which is cool. Um, I, I might have talked about my friend Alan before, Alan Liu. Um, he's an amateur fighter. I think he's 3-0 now, 4-0. Now. He might be 4-0. Um, all, all, all PA fights. And uh, he learned to wrestle by coming to college, never wrestled before. And then uh, basically just tracked down a bunch of club wrestlers first and said, hey, can you guys wrestle with me? And then eventually that led him to get into the guys on, on the D1 team at Pitt and wrestling with them. And he, he, whenever he shows up at a gym and like wrestles with the guys, the coaches are always asking him like, where did you wrestle? Where did you wrestle? Like, where did you wrestle in college? And he didn't. Um, so really Willie Allen is the best wrestler at Pitt MMA. Um, so don't, don't, you know, don't give yourself too much credit. <laughs> Next one is from David. That's at David P underscore MMA. Uh, he said, in your opinion, who are some of the most underrated MMA wrestlers? And can you explain why it's not very obvious? Thanks. Thumbs up. Um, can you explain if it's not very obvious? Um, like I said, if I don't have a lot of time to think about these, I'm not going to get great answers for you. But just off the top of my head, I think defensive wrestlers don't get enough credit. Um, and people have a hard time seeing who is a good defensive wrestler sometimes. And it's also like, are they good defensive wrestlers because they're good anti-wrestlers, which I'll get into soon, or because they're just flat good at wrestling. Um, I wrote about Pedro Munoz. Uh, I was just as astonished when I studied his wrestling, um, how, how good he is, just flat good. Um, I didn't realize it, and a lot of people didn't realize it. And I think Pedro Munoz is a guy that doesn't get the spotlight that often, so he's not really under a microscope, so maybe you wouldn't notice things like that. Um, but I mean, even against Frankie Edgar, who's still a very good takedown artist, especially at Bantamweight now, um, he had Munoz taken down like almost twice on a bunch of attempts on a five round fight. Uh, Munoz out wrestled him. Um, Munoz took down John Dodson, who's almost untakedownable, um, besides Demetrius Johnson. Um, Munoz had crazy wrestling exchanges with Jimmy Rivera. Munoz is probably one of the best wrestlers in the UFC, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, it's defense, so people don't care as much. Aldo, it's like, okay, Aldo is prolific as a defensive wrestler, so everyone knows that one, but, you know, it just it doesn't get enough shine. Um, RDA, I think, has underrated wrestling because of the cage stuff. RDA is a good wrestler. He's a good wrestler on the cage with his back on the cage. He's offensively in space. RDA is a very good wrestler. Basically, all of the guys that train at King's MMA have become really good wrestlers. Um, I know RDA is traveled around but all the guys that were in that area that uh did like the uh the church boys wrestling club with uh, jacob Harmon and whoever else was there they all got really good um besides kelvin gastelum who got worse <laughs> i think that's more of a kelvin problem than the training camp um but yeah rda i think because of his ring craft putting him on the cage a million times is why uh, he is seen as not as good of a wrestler like you can only be so good if you're going to continuously get put in these bad positions and let people try to work their offense on you, eventually it'll work. Um, so it's just, you know, poor in other regards. Um, I don't know. My brain's not really firing on all cylinders right now, but that's a couple of examples. There you go. <laughs> all right, here we go. Here, here's one that I've talked about before, but I don't expect people to have heard every podcast, remember every question I've answered and i think some of these questions are important so it's good for me to answer them a bunch uh so smash jitsu only smash for short good good buddy good pal very smart funny guy um he says what actually is counter wrestling who implements it well um so i'm going to talk about anti-wrestling as well just to draw the distinction but counter wrestling is basically trying to exploit takedown attempts trying to counter them in some way right like you're they're happening and you're going to do something offensively to do something about it right so most sorry Ivloyev in his fight with Mike Grundy he did some anti-wrestling and he did some counter-wrestling so anti-wrestling is when you fight on your feet in a striking context in a way that makes it hard to wrestle you so someone keeps level changing at you and trying to double leg you um you guys are at a distance from each other. They need to change levels and get to your legs, right? They have to hit that motion. Um, they need to cover that space. If you throw a lot of jabs, 
it's going to make it hard for them to come straight in on you because they're going to run into your jab. If you throw a lot of body punches, you're going to intercept them on their way in and get a clinch position or just, you know, stop them in their tracks. Throw a lot of like snap kicks to the body, same principle, knees, same principle. If they need to get you to the cage and you are pivoting off and, you know, getting back to the center, that's anti-wrestling. So basically just being a good striker <laughs> and having good ring craft is probably the best way to be good anti-wrestler. So most of our lawyer did all that, but he was also a counter wrestler. So basically when he did get entered on and it had to be in those wrestling situations, maybe he didn't want to be in, um, he did stuff to counter them. So Grundy is in on the legs and right away Ivloyev is like sitting out or, you know, trying to trap an arm so he can hit a fat man roll. Or uh, when he's in bottom front headlock, he hit this crazy hit head lever thing where he uh, basically ducked, ducked down deeper and got his head underneath Grundy's hips and then sat straight up and had, had an arm trap so he had no post and like threw him over his head like that. Um, more traditional is like, do you do a lot of guillotines? <laughs> do you have like front headlock reversals? Joe Benavidez as a good counter wrestler. He, uh, he has that front headlock underhook counter. So if people try to put him on his back, he hits the elevator with a butterfly hook and throws people over. That's all counter wrestling. Uh, Tony Ferguson, like trying to do the things that he does. <laughs> That's counter wrestling. Um, those are the people I would say that implement it well. Um, yeah, that's good for now. Davis and Figueredo is trying to threaten with submission attempts and like leg lock entries and things like that uh, to counter wrestling. Or you know, if you if you throw people, if you have counter takedowns of your own, that's that's a counter. You know, so same same concept as in striking. You know, they do it and then you do something to exploit it, um, make them miss or make it not work with your offense. So same same deal. Uh, this one is from Grand Moff Larkin, who uh, I don't know if he changed his at or if he had to get a new account or what. But it's Grand Moff Larkin, but the I and Larkin is a one. I don't know if it was always that way or if that's new. Um, he said, our leg rides against the cage overpowered. He said, OP. Yeah. <laughs> it's really hard because if someone's, you know, in college, if someone's riding your legs, you can you you have the whole space of the mat to move around and try to create an angle to get out of that or attack their leg. But in folk, if you, you attack their leg, it's not like you're giving up your neck to get choked. Um, but yeah, against the cage is like, you don't have a lot, a lot of places to go. If you start trying to peel their leg off or peel their hands or whatever, you start, you know, opening yourself up to chokes and things of that nature. So really you just got to flatten yourself against the cage, try to shimmy up there uh, and, and get to, you know, the standing leg ride position, which is much less dangerous. Um, but yeah, it's if you let someone get into a solid leg ride position like Iowa ride or like the leg mount, uh, stuff like that, it, it's really difficult to deal with. So best to just not let them do it at all. <laughs> uh, attacking the wrist, you know, st constant motion, staying fluid, uh, staying, staying active. Those are probably the good ideas um, with regard to that. Uh, Tim van der Heiden, I hope I didn't mess that up. That's at Limsma. I, I probably screwed that up too. L I M S M A. He said, How do I cope with wrestling slash grappling withdrawals while lockdown just got extended for another three weeks where I live? So I think he means training. Um, or what are some good freestyle matches to get into following the sport of wrestling a little better? I think that dual meets are the best form of wrestling. Uh, dual meet is in college usually when one team wrestles another team so there are tournaments where you have an, an entrant at every you know weight class and they wrestle to the top of their weight it's you know however many people in the weight you know how tournaments work uh, but a dual meet is when each team has one person at every each of the 10 weights and then your 125 pounder wrestles their 125 pounder and so on and there are points based on how much they win by and then you win or lose as a team. Um, it really, really makes you invested in the score <laughs> of each match. Uh, it makes each match more important. And folk style matches are, are seven minutes. So it's really not that long. So even if a match is like a 3-1 snoozer, um, it matters for the overall implications of the team race, right? So if you go to YouTube, honestly, if you don't even have like a subscription to any service that has wrestling on it, 
uh, like ESPN or, uh, you know, Flow Wrestling or what have you, um, you can watch a lot of dual meets on YouTube. So just, you know, think of some schools and you go like Penn State versus Iowa or Oklahoma State versus whoever. You know what I mean? Uh, you can find it pretty easily. And if they're on YouTube, they're probably good. So <laughs> I would just go ahead and watch a couple of dual meets. That'll take up a decent amount of time for you, but it'll also be really fun. Um, and then with regard to freestyle, there's so many matches. Um, you could like go to UWW's event page and just look at like the world championships or this past individual world cup, for instance, and just go to the event page and click on whatever gold medal match and just watch the finalists and see how they're doing. I've wrote a million articles about freestyle wrestlers and there's always videos of wrestling in them. So you, you could watch those matches. Um, I wrote an article about 2019 world championships for freestyle and which matches were good at that. And I have a playlist. So you can look at that. Um, lots of ways to watch wrestling, but yeah, just hit me up if you want to find any of that really. But yeah, that's my recommendation. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Leon, whose name is currently give me the dong on March 6th because the song Yadong is fighting. And uh, I don't, I'm just afraid of pronouncing his last name. And uh, I feel like I'm going to do a slur, so I'm not going to say it, but I'll spell it. But at Leon, Z-E-N-E-G-G-E-R. And that's his name. So don't give him any crap for it. Just his name. But he is, uh, I think he's from Iceland. And he loves Gunnar Nelson. And he said, uh, his question is Gunnar Nelson. And I said, anything in particular? He said, maybe his body locks, question mark. Uh, yeah, it's not that complicated. <laughs> Gunnar Nelson, uh, you know, has his in and out karate style and he times blitzes right he times blitzing entries on like his rear straight and things of that nature um that transitions really well into a body lock because usually people try to counter high or they bring their guard up or whatever and they open up that window um on your body right so he could blast in straight into the body lock or he could weave off the right hand into the body lock or he could intercept your entry with the body lock and he's just uh, good at getting the angle and and crunching you straight over just because he has so much forward momentum, he can just kind of hit it that way. Um, I don't think it's too deep, but it works really well with his game. Uh, and that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> I have a ton of new notifications. Um, I'm going to take a look at them. I don't know how long I've been recording at this point. When did I say I started? Like nine, it was like 9.17. It's like 9.40 now. Okay, it hasn't been that long. I can do more. Um, Juice to the Gills, an OG question asker on the uh, the Wrestling for MMA podcast. Um, it's Juiced number two, the Gills. Um, he asks, heavy hands, boys. That's Connor and Phil, for those who are uninitiated. Um, often refer to Felder, Paul Felder, as a secret slash accidental wrestler, as he does some of his best work there in wrestling, I guess. Um, who are other fighters whose strength is the wrestling, even if it isn't billed as such? Ask this question for the last Q&A, but can't remember the exact words. Martin Campman is the answer. Go back and watch some Martin Campman fights. That guy was a wrestler. Um, he trained at Extreme Couture, and I think you know, he's picked it up really well. And that's a guy that was like always a striker, but actually he's a wrestler. Um, so that's a good one. I uh, Yeah, off the cuff, it's hard to do this. Um, people who are actually better grapplers than strikers, but, you know, better wrestlers than strikers. I don't know. I, I, you don't want to hear me sit here and think about it, but go watch Martin Cannon. <laughs> That's all I got for you. Um, thanks, man. Thanks, Juiced. Uh, a follow-up to Grand Moff Larkin's questions about leg rides. Um, he said, which leg ride would be best? Cross body? Um, I think the Iowa ride's really good. So basically the concept of, of riding is you want to sit on their hips. You want to put your hips, you want to put your weight on their hip. So you pick a side and you put your weight on that side. If you are on the left side, it makes sense to throw a boot and throw a leg in and uh, lock down the leg on that side. So you can put your hips on their hips and you get the leg controlled and you can, you know, go across, uh, you know, across their waist and get a tight waist and keep chopping out that arm and go uh, claw ride or half or whatever you want to do and put a lot of pressure on that side. And if they start to, you know, get away to the other side, very easy to let go and swivel around and apply the same ride to the other side and just go back and forth. 
um, or just not put a leg in and, you know, just keep claw riding to each side or keep putting halves in on both sides and breaking them down and riding them. Uh, I like re- leg riding. So you pick one hip or you go both the legs in. Um, and that's just like putting hooks in in jujitsu and getting, getting flattening them out for the back mount. Uh, there's other rides from other positions, but I would say those are the most stable. Um, it's just different in folk because you have to be working for a turn. So whatever the most dominant position is for just holding someone down isn't necessarily the one that's going to be the most common or useful in folk style because it has to result in a turn. You're going to get hit for stalling. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's my answer. Um, but yeah, I think in MMA, like the leg mount, like when they're seated against the cage and you uh, put their legs underneath you and scoop those up, that's pretty cool. Um, but I think the Iowa rad works really well because it also frees up. You can just go tight waist and keep that your weight in their hip, and keep their leg locked down, but you can still have a free hand to punch. And they need that hand posted to get his height to try to escape. Otherwise, they're just, you know, hanging out on the ground with their arm blocking their face. And that's still not a good position for them. So I think that's a really good position for MMA, and you see it a lot. Uh, Ryan Bader uh, showed it off a lot against Matt Mitrion. And if you don't want to, want to watch it against someone who just is hopelessly helpless. <laughs> cool. Let's move on. Um... Furiously high says, why do you think the half Nelson is such an underutilized technique in MMA? Also rear ankle rides. Uh, That's a good question. I think when people, you know, jujitsu really prioritizes the back and back control and getting your hooks in and stuff like that. So when people try to build up, the instinct is usually to get to that rear rear standing position, that that rear waist lock position, especially if you're against the cage because you want to get that angle so you're still on their back. Um, But you saw like Steve Miocic versus Francis Ngannou. He was really prioritizing keeping pressure on the back of his head. That's the same concept as a half, really, um, just to break someone down, but also you can put someone on their back, put someone over. But yeah, I think just the priorities of grappling positions are why you don't see it as much in MMA. Um, he said also rear ankle rides, which is you know what I was just talking about. Um, but yeah, I think it just has to do with jiu-jitsu, the jiu-jitsu meta and the priorities that people are taught for MMA and, and where they try to focus their game. Um, <laughs> uh, and Bilal Yusuf's joke question about the Dagestani handcuff uh, Hero Stratus 420 said huh that's a wrist ride from American folk style so yeah that is why he said that uh, Curry Boy Davi likes soup who uh, I'm, I'm good pals with and we, we share our mutual uh, mental disorders with each other. <laughs> not, not quite, not quite. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but he's a good guy. Um, he said, you've probably gone over this before. So I'll pose two questions. Oh God. Um, could you go over some really basic terminology? What is meant by rides, cradle, things of that nature. I feel like I know what I'm looking at, but get terribly confused here in wrestling described. Well, hopefully my answer from before about rides is helpful. It's just, you know, those systems of keeping someone on the ground. That's it. Um, <laughs> and there's a, there's a whole bunch of different types of rides. Um, so if you watch folk style, you'll see them. You'll see them for sure. Um, cradle, there are a whole bunch of different kinds of cradles, but a cradle is when you lock your hands around the head and under a leg. That's a cradle, different grips, whatever you want to do. Um, yeah, a- any version of that is a cradle. You could do go like near side cradle. So if you're like, Imagine you're in referee's position or turtle um, and you come off to one side. Now you have your head in the ribs, more or less. One arm around the head, one arm around the leg, crunch them together. Or you could like go one side and then run them toward the other side and then crunch together. Or maybe you have really long arms and you're really strong and you can crunch them together. That's a near side cradle. Uh, you can catch cradles and scrambles. A um, whole bunch of different setups for that. But yeah, cradles are cool. Um, in MMA, they're cool as well because you can uh, use them to you know, basically pass or set up a guillotine or mount them or put them wherever you want to put them. Um, so it's nice. It's a nice move. Uh, other wrestling terminology that I say that is confusing? I don't know. Let me know what you're confused about. <laughs> I'll try to explain it. It's the best I can do. Uh, oh, here's his second question. What is the most impressed you've been with a wrestling heavy game plan from a fighter that you didn't expect it from? Hmm. Hmm. 
I don't know. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to. Uh, it's hard to remember. You know, it's hard to remember who. Uh... This is a terrible answer, but here you go. Uh, without me preparing for these, all my answers are gonna be pretty bad. But here's one. Uh, not a fighter I didn't expect to wrestle, but a fighter I didn't expect to wrestle well successfully in the fight. Uh, Frankie Edgar versus Gray Maynard, two and three. Um, if you watch the first fight, Maynard won the wrestling exchanges, but it was actually fairly competitive. Uh, but Maynard just looked too big for him. Uh, and Maynard's also the more credentialed collegiate wrestler. Um, and then the second and third fight, it was very competitive from a wrestling standpoint. And Edgar definitely had his uh, his wrestling better incorporated into his MMA game. And he basically just dominated him uh, from a wrestling standpoint. There was a huge slam in the second round. He had a bunch of strong positions uh, past that. And in the, the, uh, the final fight, he actually knocked him out off of a, a shot. So uh, that, that was pretty cool. So uh, Frankie Edgar surprised me a couple of times. Um, maybe not a wrestling heavy game plan, but Peter Yan took your eye favor down a bunch of times. That was pretty amazing. Um, I wrote about that. Um, yeah, those are a couple answers. Who's wrestling impressed you least from a fighter you expected great wrestling from and about where wrestling did happen? So a wrestler that I thought was good in a fight where wrestling happened where it wasn't impressive. I don't, I don't want to say not impressive, but just like, man, I expected more from you. Um, I could say Ben Askren. <laughs> that could be a fair answer. But one I've been thinking about lately a lot is Johnny Hendricks. Um, Johnny Hendricks has looked pretty dominant from a wrestling standpoint in a lot of fights. Against Robbie Lawler in the first fight, he, uh, he looked solid. But the second fight, he looked so one-dimensional and shallow with his wrestling, just like shooting on a leg, getting sprawled on, just sitting there and not, not being able to build up. He was tired, but, you know, you, you wrestle tired in, in matches. That's pretty common. And just, you know, for a guy of his caliber, it definitely surprised me. Um, with a wrestling heavy game plan, I mean, usually if guys are really committed to the wrestling, it works. Um, they're ain't good at it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry. Sorry for my bad answers. Uh, any more questions? Oh, Olivia Gambucci, Brandon Gambucci's wife, <laughs> says, are there high-level guys who have absolutely no wrestling background or skills? In MMA, absolutely. Um, the famous one is, is George St. Pierre, obviously. He, uh, he's Canadian, so already very low chance of wrestling background. Um, he's from a karate background, in fact, and he just started training wrestling for, hit, for MMA and just had a real knack for it, very uh, athletic uh, type. For it, uh, I, I did a career commentary of a bunch of GSP's fights for uh, the fight site on Patreon, and uh, there's one part where uh, he's fighting Matt Hughes, who's a very credentialed uh, collegiate wrestler and uh, was dominating MMA with wrestling at the time. He goes to take GSP down with like a body lock. He goes to step around the leg to finish the body lock takedown. And GSP, this dude jumps over it. He jumps over the chirp attempt. So stuff like that, even, even early on, uh, he just had like great balance he's like a cat uh very strong and, and super explosive athlete so he he picked up the double leg very quickly and the double leg's a great technique to incorporate into mma just because the way striking opens you up for it um but yeah i mean george st pierre uh very very good mma wrestler uh i mean jose aldo became an amazing wrestler uh no wrestling background soccer background and then started jujitsu and then muay thai and then became an MMA fighter and uh, probably the best best or second best wrestler in MMA history, I would say. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you look at like the rankings today, like Israel Adesanya is very high level and he's not a wrestler and doesn't have a wrestling background. It's very new to him. Um, it's less common for people from striking or jujitsu backgrounds, let's say, uh, to become that level in MMA just because wrestling is a really hard gap to make up. But yeah, it, it happens all the time. Thanks, Liv. I like that we're friends now. That's nice. Um, ben Cohn. Do I have to answer Ben's question? He's my colleague. I don't know. Hmm. Okay. Ben says, how good of an MMA wrestler is Clay Guida? Better than you'd expect. <laughs> I think he was yeah, on a, uh, a national championship team in junior college, which means literally nothing because he didn't win a national title. But he, uh, he was a good wrestler in Illinois, I believe. 
and, uh, you know, wrestling college and coaches wrestling and is very deep in wrestling. And, um, I mean, yeah, he's very strong, has a great motor. So already that's good for MMA, but, um, yeah, very tenacious. Uh, if you want to watch like a late career, good wrestling performance, uh, Eric Koki, he wrestled pretty vigorously. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's just, uh, has a good chin, very durable and, you know, was good at running people to the cage and, and was very strong on the cage and, you know, just a very, meat and potatoes uh wrestling system and then you have like the anthony pettis fights where he's doing it more in open space like reactive shots and the takanori gomi fight where he uh was really annoying on the outside and then waited for him to throw and then shot underneath so he's pretty athletic um you know surprisingly so considering how bad his striking looks most of the time but an athletic wrestler for sure uh quite an animal and uh i've heard a party animal <laughs> as well uh but clay Guida is a cool guy and uh yeah i mean just pretty pretty good <laughs> pretty good mma wrestler i think if his striking was better it would be a lot better but considering what his striking is i think he made it work pretty well thank you ben um i got a couple more here people are still going people are still going uh, i will go for another like 15 20 minutes so my mouth is getting dry hold on quick water break I like these rapid fire non-committal Q&A sessions where I don't really need to do any prep. But prep is what kills me. I'd have to, I feel a responsibility to answer the questions well, but in this format, I'm just going to do my, the worst job possible. <laughs> okay, so Hero Stratus is back. Hero Stratus 420. I've seen him around. Seems knowledgeable, cool, cool person. Uh, a dog is barking her head off. He said uh, Bajrang Rutherford was 3-3. Three, three. And then, by American rules, Zane got a takedown, but in the process, exposed his back for a split second. Bajrang got a two-point exposure, and Zane got a one-point reversal. The guy who got taken down won. Why are freestyle rules so dumb? Well, <laughs> freestyle has a different re reward structure, right? The point of freestyle is to expose your opponent's back to the mat. Um, the mark of a good freestyle wrestler is they do not let their back show to the mat. Similar in folk style, right? You know, you get near fall for exposing their back to the mat and uh, pinning is important as well in, in freestyle and folk style. But folk style is more about, can you control the person physically, literally control them? Freestyle is more about, can you control the exchanges? Are you the one who determines when backs are being shown to the mat? So if you shoot in on me in a double, and I get a chest trap and I expose you through and you finish the double, but I exposed your back in the middle of the double, two points for me, one point for you. If you finish the double, um, that's just the way it is. It, it incentivizes different kind of scoring and it, really, it makes the sport more exciting, you know, um, in a way <laughs> it makes scoring more, more possible, uh, more ways to score. It definitely doesn't quite incentivize you to attack because you don't want to get exposed, but at the same time, I mean, it, it, it's a different, it's a, just a different style, different mindset. Um, I think it's cool. I think it's cool. It's, it, it really opens up the style a lot. If you watch their guys like uh, Georgi Rubayev, someone recent that I've been interested in, uh, someone who's a lot better <laughs> for that example would be, um, shoot, I'm forgetting his name. Come on. Come on. I'm losing it. I'm losing it. Hold on. It was the 2019 Alans tournament. He was briefly number one in the world after he won this tournament. Oh my God, it's gonna kill me. I'm gonna die. I can't get this. Not 2018. Ah, uh, ah, uh, come on, come on. I'm gonna go to my highlight video. This is the worst possible way to do this. First Aliyev, uh, I figured it out before I got to the video. Uh, Ferzalia from Russia, he is like, his style is all freestyle exposures. Like he does not really shoot. He doesn't really do anything that you would consider a wrestling move. It's all just about creating exposures. And I think that's very impressive. I chose a good degree of control. Um, if you think about like Ben Askren's style in, in college, I mean, not people didn't like it at first because you're like, well, he's not really beating me at wrestling, but you know, in some cases he was, but a lot of the times he's like funking his way out of positions and creating exposures and uh, just controlling people in ways that they can't deal with. And I think that's kind of cool. So 
you know, it has it has its merits. I understand the the objective view of I took you down. Why do you get more points than me? That doesn't make sense. It doesn't. But you know, in the context of the greater rule scheme, it, ha- it has to be that way. Um, I, I I do kind of like folk more conceptually, um, but I like watching freestyle more. Just more more exciting to me. Thank you. Uh, Theo Binst, who is uh, at Theo Binst, he's a French person. I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong. Uh, he's an aspiring fighter and I believe a wrestler. Uh, he says, how does Yaroslav Amasa fare in the wrestling department against the best welterweights in the world? I think he does really well against them. <laughs> I think more of a concern is his striking, honestly. Uh, I think his striking is pretty good. You know, it works against the Logan Storleys and Ed Ruths of the world, but uh, it's a little bit jank. Um, definitely high volume and has some good ideas, but pretty jank. Um, I don't think his wrestling is a problem at all. I think his wrestling is very, very, very good. Um, I think Kamaru Usman is probably the only person I could cleanly expect to beat him at wrestling. Um, I think Yaroslav Amasa versus Colby Covington would be a very competitive fight. Um, but yeah, read my article about uh, Amasa versus Ed Ruth and then watch my video about Amasa versus Storley. It's not a breakdown, it's just a highlight of all the cool stuff he did and how great that fight was. Thank you, Theo. Uh, Sandro, I revealed your name. Sorry. Uh, cool thought <laughs> at Jab Zuda, one of my best friends on, on the internets. Um, he said, if I am six foot three, he's not, and do not work out, he does. Could I beat up Henry Suhudo because I am bigger? I think I could, and will get really mad at you if you say I wouldn't. Next question is from Dan Burrows, B-U-R-R-O-W-S, not Burrows, like Jordan Burrows. Why do I suck so much at wrestling? Well, I think the answer is pretty obvious. If you spell your name differently, you know, you would unlock your full potential, but you choose to spell it incorrectly and you don't have access to the wrestling, the collective wrestling knowledge of the Burrows name. So that is the answer. I got... I got one more. I got one more and I'm going to end it, I think. It's a, a, a longer question. This one is from Chungus Khan, uh, Chungus Khan 03. That's Iggy Shekelberger, for those of you who remember his old name. He's the host of the Tendragome, Ten, Tendragome, I can't say it, podcast on the fight site, which is on hiatus. And uh, it's a really smart fella from Siberia, from Ulan Ude. Well, I shouldn't reveal that. He's not from anywhere. Um, sorry, man. <laughs> if we go with the idea of using wrestling threats to set up attacks and transition, I need to read this again. For going with the idea of using wrestling threats to set up attacks and transition beyond the usual level change fake out and using wrestling to create space for strikes instead of taking away space, taking space away for control, what would your ideal wrestling boy MMA fighter styles look like? So I'm, I have to read it more times so i think we're saying traditionally we have using wrestling attacks wrestling threats to set up attacks and transitions like level fake overhand or like touch your leg punch stuff like that i think that's what he means um using wrestling to create space for strikes instead of taking away space for control no i think i I think he does mean the way of using wrestling to strike instead of using striking to wrestle. Uh, ideal style. I mean, it kind of looks the same as somebody who uses striking to wrestle. You know what I mean? Um, you still have to be able to put the threat out there. You still have to be able to get to the legs consistently and show the same threats. So I think you need to be the same guy. Um, so who does that? Frank Yeager does that. Um, Robert Whitaker started doing that. Uh, Peter Yan does that. Make me think on the spot. I don't know. People do that. <laughs> um, but I, I think it would be the same. I think it would be the same because you have to be able to do both or it doesn't work. Um, the threat needs to be real. Um, you need to be able to put yourself in those same positions to, to do it. So it, it would be the same style, really. Um, unless I'm misinterpreting your question, which I might be. Probably am. 
All right, I took less time on that than I expected because I'm dumb. Uh, Sam answer says, why is wrestling? I got, I got no answers for you, bro. I don't know. All right. That was, a, that was a solid like 45 minutes there. Um, don't have any more questions rolling in. Uh, that, that was pretty fun. That was a good time. I think I answered all of them. Well, no, I skipped Andrews. Sorry, Andrew. Um, yeah, I cannot do every podcast like this, but if I have nothing else to talk about, I'm, I'm down to, to go with the rapid fire. And uh, yeah, thank you for all responding. And if he took longer than 45 minutes to answer and I didn't get to your question, that's on you. So that just goes to show you, you should respond to my tweets quickly because if I don't get enough engagement early on, I get discouraged and I go, oh, no one cares about me and I delete it and then you'll have no chance. So appreciate me while you have me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> see everybody next week. I'll talk about something silly probably. We'll see. <laughs>